Welcome to Quantified Software. Today I have David Thor with me. He's done uh, a few different things which I find interesting and I, I think will make for a great conversation. Um, started out doing undergrad CS through uh, software consulting, so saw a few different things there into director of engineer at a, at a startup. They got uh, acquired by a very large company and saw that transition and then now is off, off on his own. So David, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is a fun opportunity to kind of recap some of the things that have been done, try to add metrics to it and, and remember what I may have forgotten. So that'll be good. <laughs> so uh, first off, what's the, the startup you're working on right now? What's your current project? Uh, so the current project is funny enough, a summation of that rapid succession of corporate experiences, that kind of roller coaster I went through with enterprise and startups and back to enterprise again. And seeing that a lot of the same problems persist for the internal operations of engineering teams, um, specifically around DevOps automation, especially with microservices and distributed systems, there's not really yet the paved path forward for people to contribute to cloud native applications in a graceful way, collaborate at scale. A lot of teams are building DIY solutions to broker this collaboration that are shaped the same way. So I wanted to take inspiration from those and make really DevOps and automation of first class citizen for engineering teams building cloud native software. And mm -hmm. Architect is that tool to help with that. Okay, Architect.io. So if I'm a developer and I, I hear that and I say, oh, that sounds interesting. What is the, uh, what is the prototype of, I'm in an organization of X engineers. What are you looking for as far as like, I, the, the product will be a perfect fit for me right out of the gate? Yes. So, uh, you know, the hard part about a product like this is that DevOps is a problem that a lot of orgs have to face once you reach, you know, a very low minimum threshold. You've got maybe half a dozen to a dozen engineers, you have a few different microservices and quickly people are finding that I don't know how to run this anymore. We have our pipelines to get it into production and that's about it. And people lose track of how do I create new stuff in it. Um, that ranging up all the way to the enterprise is where people can't really afford the giant platform orgs, people who are gonna maintain or build these guardrails or sophisticated solutions to get from local development all the way through to production for any number of complex um, integrations or APIs. So really that mid-market tier, if you're looking at yourself and say, you say, hey, I, will, I wanna create a new service in an already microservices stack, and I really don't know how to handle the networking, the security, credentialing, the guardrails that should help me get it from testing to production. And there's no one here that can really help me either. I have maybe some code samples and that's it. You come to us and figure out how we're blending traditional dependency management with continuous deployment to just make it really, really easy for you to connect to peer APIs, build on top of them, and release your code quickly. I like that. That's a good uh, dependency management on on top of CI/CD. That's uh, wish I had that at my last uh, job. So <laughs> you started that off with uh, um, where you're at now, but that it is a summation of where you came from. So maybe if you give us a uh, flesh out a little bit that that intro I did of, you know, kind of what those teams were like, sizes, types of projects, velocity that, that those teams would have, if you could uh, kind of fill that out. Yeah, of course. Um, in this case, I'd say the dev shop is where the first inklings of an idea like this start to come into play, in large part because you're building a lot of the same grunt work and foundations for your customers until you notice patterns for yourself, commit those to separate repositories, and now you have something off the shelf for your next customer and your next client. Mm -hmm. And that's really the pattern that I was hoping for with the dev shop is to identify shared problem spaces that I can materialize into products. Um, I had started noodling on some of these shared repositories. How can I connect them all together? Not a fully formed thought yet, but when I, instead of finding my product then through inspiration from those customers, I had a non-traditional way of acquiring the product idea that I wanted to work on, which was one of our customers now confirmed.io came to me and wanted to fill out the engineering team with my four team members at the time, bring us all in and really build this thing up from the ground. They had no product at the time and needed a lot of help on the cloud and backend infrastructure to really stand this thing up. So mm -hmm. that seemed like a great opportunity. I love the product idea. Fell into my lap in an entirely different way than I thought. But that turned my four-person team quickly into six with the two other engineers they had, they had brought on. And over the course of the next two and a half years before we sold the company, we grew to 20 engineers and about 35 people in total. Um, so it was an awesome growth path that started with me building a services business uh, translated that into a product business that wasn't my idea, but I still got to build from zero to 60. 
And then, of course, seeing that through to being integrated fully into a giant enterprise organization. Yeah, that's uh, something like three doublings in uh, o- over just uh, as many years. So that's always a, a fun yeah. ramp. Um, yeah, you know, very fun. And, and clearly, the uh, you're not too scared of the the first days of going zero to one team member. So uh, back at it again, which is yeah. which is awesome. Um, yeah, I'd but, say the first time was scary, but the second time not quite as much. So in in that uh, early days, or even once you start to have some product shipped out the door, one of the the critical things is is understanding what is the next thing to build, what is the next feature, what is the next piece to work on. So how do you think through that priority function of we have a hundred things we want to do. We can only do one today. What is that that one that we're going to pick? Yeah, and it's always an interesting problem. I'd say before you can even figure out what to pick, you need to make sure you're framing it in such a way that you can guarantee it's valuable. And starting to do that is being able to articulate the problem effectively. In startups, that's often non-trivial. You're not working on very targeted features in an otherwise existing application. You're talking about the business and the core functional aspects of it. So how do I frame my problem in such a way that I can petition it to others and make sure that they understand the problem, it resonates with them, and then I can work and backtrace into the solution. So there's a lot of frameworks for product management that focus on similar tactics or even just operations for companies, whether it's OKRs and how you break down top level objectives, distribute them to teams and individuals and start building that graph structure that is sub problems of your original problem. It's really important to break that down enough to be handed off to teams to have autonomy working on them, but not so much that you're spending six, 12 months on a waterfall spec that might get thrown out the window anyway. Then it's a careful balancing there, but the most important thing is to figure out, define my problem, and then work with the people who would in theory do it to scope it and evaluate it. That's Mm -hmm. how you really build a backlog that's effective. You need enough of a backlog almost always to get six weeks to 12 weeks of work done so that you can prioritize them and have something to calibrate against. But once you have that, then you work with the sales teams, you work with people talking to customers and you say, hey, here's two different roads we could take to achieve different sets of solutions. You knowing you're in touch with the customers, which customers you might gain, which customers you might lose, which of these paths forward gets more valuable for you and thus for the business. So it's really a collaborative effort, but you need to be able to break it down so that people can all contribute to the information that would yield that. Okay, let's unpack that. There was a lot of di- there was a lot of, of information. Course, yeah. I, I want to f- have several follow-ups on that. So um, first, you talk about OKRs, and my understanding of those is that very much they are kind of directional um, goals for the company or for the that then map down to each individual contributor. How do you how are you driving towards a goal? So they're much. You might set those at a at a twelve month cycle, um, and mm-hmm. that. Then inside of there, I heard you say that targeting a six to 12 months, so month and a half, or sorry, six to 12 week, um, month and a half to three month backlog. And what kind of what granularity in the backlog would you think that those items would be groomed or specced to? How how detailed would those, would that backlog be? Uh, So it really comes down to preference and resources for the grooming. But first I'll touch on the OKR question, which OKR was more of the comp for this kind of hierarchical structure of triage. And it's something we see in inheritance and engineering. There's lots of representations of stuff like that where you try to break down something large into smaller parts so that you can parallelize it. Um, OKRs are similar, but in our case, we're not dealing with the core corporate objectives that have been set from the top down. We're dealing with customer facing problems that we know are features or potential features we need to scope and work on. So the timelines are changing a little bit more. We end up stacking them a little bit linearly instead of evaluating completion on an annual or fixed rate basis. Um, But once you get into actually trying to curate and evaluate that backlog, you really start with framing the problem, get them down to, you know, the traditional user story scope where I can say, here's the persona that I'm targeting. Here's the problem space that I'm working on. And here's roughly the solution category that I want to do. Um, You hand that off to designers, you get them to put a little bit more scoping around the user facing implementation. And then of course you get it in front of engineers to scope out what it would take to produce that outcome. And at that point, you now have a curated issue that, you know, no one's really married to these things. Again, focusing on more abstract concepts like story points instead of days, weeks, or months is a much better way to figure out how to calibrate. Um, Because then you're not at the mercy of 
this hour matters, this day matters. I can buffer something or deliverable to a customer by a little bit and be caught either way. It's really um, important well, to provide that flexibility. Our, what's your rule of thumb of like, or what's your, your gut as far as like- um, The buffer? No, on, on any issue, you know, is, is one, if you point it in story points, you're still gonna have a, a sense because you, you start with this story point, which is, you know, it has a unit, but it's an abstract unit. But then you also said that you have roughly six to 12 weeks. So you have some internal transform function yeah. to go from points to time. You're just not talking about time at always when you're talking about story points. So, you know, what's your rough, each item is, is a day of work or a week of work or what's your kind of, what feels yeah, like threshold? Obviously that's super important at a day one or day zero startup because the reason for story points is to allow it to be flexible for different team members, the different work, some discrepancy in the estimation process. But since we don't have historical data, we have to set our first baseline. So what's one story point worth today, even if we allow that to be different three sprints from now when we have more data. Mm -hmm. um, the ballpark for us was that we generally started, and this is something we went through very recently, where our lowest common use case for something at the scales we were talking about was about half a day. Then we worked up to about half a week, and then we worked up to about uh, a full sprint cycle. And with our team size, we were allowing our senior engineers to take on relatively large tasks. Many of our tasks are large because the product went from zero to 60 and not 60 to 65. Yeah. Um, and that means things can take a sprint at a time for an individual contributor to work on. Um, what we have found is that looking back at our burn down charts and some of the metrics we get from the issue management tool we use once we do this level of annotation, you know, we run into being partially correct and maybe a little bit discounted. We're finding that it's rare that when we say something's going to take a whole sprint, it does. Our team, our team in particular right now is fairly conservative with their estimates. So we're finding that we're completing sprints earlier and in advance. So now going forward, if we really wanted to be on the money, we can still take the same estimation process from the engineers, but we can actually change how we're stacking up the sprint to get closer and closer to being exactly right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's that flexibility built into the process by using both the consistent estimation from the engineers and historical data to plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. So when you say using historical data, you're saying look back at, what's, what's your look back period? A couple of sprints or are you trying Mine's to- about three sprints. Something okay. to normalize, but obviously data gets stale. So you wanna make sure you're using as recent data as possible. And have you gone through um, recently on your current team? It sounds like you're talking about this this look back and you're you're finishing early, which sounds like a great place to be in. Um, have you onboarded a new engineer and seen um, some change to the stats, or have you had to uh, kind of adjust as as a team yet, or is that something that you're looking forward to? So we, well, I'm looking forward to it mostly. We have added one engineer since our original founding. Uh, Stack filled it up right at the beginning because our product was fairly development intense and we spent the first better part of a year, year and a half just working on product development and filled out with engineers and have had a pretty consistent team and process now for several months. And we just released our beta a week and a half ago, planning on that ramping up quite a bit in the next six to 12 months going forward. And we're looking forward to seeing those changes. Um, mm -hmm. But largely it has been quite stable. So you, you've selected item, you have some priority function using, using sales and people kind of market, market awareness to, to use that priority function to stack the, the product roadmap going forward or the backlog going forward. Um, and you have the sprint cycle, so you have engineers working and how do you determine or how have you thought through measuring uh, the quality of the work that is done? How do you know that you've achieved done and when, when is 80% enough and when when are there problems that are showstoppers that you, you can't let it roll or you can't deploy it or, and how do you, yep. um, how do you, what's your process? Do you have metrics around how to, how to think through that? Yeah, I'll probably rely a little bit more on the confirm experience, the prior one for answering this one, because the, prim the primary driver is always customers. It's always revenue. It's always sales. That's metric number one. You add in other metrics to, compensate for that and then have to figure out what what ratio I account for them. But sales driver, customer happiness, customer success is really the far and beyond the biggest one. If you release a feature customers are unhappy about to the point where they are not going to use or not resubscribe or subscribe at all to your product, 
you have done something wrong. And that usually comes through in lack of sales. The measurement has a little bit of a tail on it, but you learn pretty quickly that this was bad and I should probably unwind it quickly. The other things that can go wrong is if this has impact on not necessarily the user experience, but SLAs, performance, or other you know, degrading metrics over time. Did I implement this with a bad query in such a way that it could do poorly? And I, that's where monitoring observability and a lot of other tools in a production environment would come into play. Not necessarily that a customer would report it. You don't want it to get that far, but you want to make sure that you can catch things before they ever happen. And then the last one is really um, estimation. So I use this one a lot to find out quality and success. And uh, again, how you factor in tech debt into this comes into the um, estimation process as well. If developers are able to meet or beat their own estimates for how long something is taking, then everything is reasonably fine. It's not necessarily a reason to invest in technical debt because everything is predictable. And predictable is good for most businesses. If I can figure out the right paved road to contribute to my application, I might be able to do it a little faster. I might not, but there's really not a problem explicitly to be solved unless all the developers are unhappy because they know they're buffering this two, three, four times as long to compensate for that. And then they'll tell you, of course. Um, so I've gone through a few metrics there. Number one being customer feedback. Number two being observability, performance, other degrading behaviors that you can observe from software mechanics. Uh, and the others are around developer experience, their ability to estimate and their happiness with the ability to contribute to the application. Yeah, and then you threw in tech debt, which is just like chum in the water that I want to like go right to that. So but let's go through each of those. So uh, talking through customer happiness, sales, I think is pretty clear. You mentioned that at the start, which is mm -hmm. like, you know, did they sign the contract? Did they click the button? Did they give us a credit card? Um, yep. Dollars or, or count of customers. Um, and like you said, if the sales cycle is long, you might have a, a long tail of, of feedback on that one. So customer happiness, how have you seen that measured? How has that worked well? How has it failed you? Where did you feel like there were gaps? What could be improved? Yeah, there's certainly a bigger tail on learning customer happiness. Um, the traditional product manager feedback to do it in advance is to try to get designs together, clickable prototypes, and try to get a baseline before you ever release or develop a feature of whether or not that's going to work out well. But assuming you've already gone through that and assuming you've now released the feature, you really are tracking usage. Um, someone won't necessarily tell you. If they really hate it, they will. That's really bad. Um, but more often than not, they'll simply re regret or otherwise not engage with the products in the same capacity they were before. You'll get things like drop-off rates. You'll get, you maybe won't even get churn, but you'll get someone engaging with the platform less and less. And that's something that can take tails on weeks or even months to really see materialize, which is why it's kind of dangerous to have happen. And you really need to be on point to measure all of that using traditional click habits and engagement habits and telemetry to find out what your users are doing. Because you can easily sell a product into a big org and not have any of the people internally use it. And you're not going to get a resubscription 12 months from now. That seems to indicate that you would highly value uh, cohort-based activity, kind of the, the classic gaming daily active, monthly active, weekly active users on a, on a per account basis maybe, or, or at least on a, when the, when the signup started? As granular as you can afford is really the answer. And startups usually can afford to do per account and per user and figure out monthly active, daily active. Tracking per feature and tracing all that all the way through the application logic is really just a big data problem. Do you have the staff to really analyze this data and find out the churn rates at a more granular level? If you do, great, not many orgs do, and you get, definitely get diminishing returns on investment the more granular you get. If you have 500 million users, then you know, 1 million users impacted by something is a big number. If you have 50,000 users, then 100 users impacted by something is a little bit different. So you really have to decide for yourself if it's worth granular investments or it's not and figure out if you can afford to pay someone to do it. Yes, yeah, so before, this is an interesting use case. I've seen in the consumer space the the cohort tracking for signups and really kind of like a, a lot of blog posts and a lot of uh, internet chatter um how have you thought through that on a more of an enterprise SaaS basis where you have an account and then it may take a few weeks before they sign people up and train people internally how what do you pick as your start date for those those cohort tracks or 
how do you how do you think through that problem? Yep. So my last business, I'd almost say for what I've seen for B2B SaaS was cheating because we had one very hyper targeted entry point for our customers, which was send us a picture of a driver's license and we'll tell you if it's real or not. And all of our work was basically underneath that, looking at individual security features and figuring out how those factored into our confidence score that we returned back. Um, but that meant that most of our tracking was our business units inside the enterprise accounts that we've sold sending transactions to us. Are they sending pictures of driver's licenses and passports to us? And what's the ratio of our returns? And what we found is that some teams aren't as willing to adopt the friction that some of this high security standard process involves and almost would rather set up support if you can be very strict but have to falsely reject 20% of the people coming through something and send those off to a call center. Sometimes the logistics for some customers weren't worth it. And they just said, we'll just do the call center for the whole thing. These 500 use cases, if I can cut 400 out of them out, it's not particularly valuable. But if I can cut 400,000 out of 500,000, that's a big difference. So we wanted to make sure that when we landed a deal, which we'd sell in advance, we'd deploy on site, we'd get them there, we'd be able to understand, all right, how many different business users are making calls with different API keys and how many, how frequent is the transaction patterns and is it going up? If it's not, or if it's going down, we know that something isn't tuned right about the product for their use case, or they don't understand enough about how to tune confidence score systems to really deal with it. Then we knew that that was a bad experience for those customers, even if there wasn't necessarily a way we could solve the problem because it was a hard space and we were never gonna be 100% accurate. We needed to find a way to get them to understand the problem space better and understand, is this a viable use case? Are, are you gonna be churning cycles, trying desperately to integrate it when you should have people staffing this call center. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So were all of the, all that telemetry and all those metrics, was that all home rolled, um, home collected uh, metrics or were you using off the shelf services to do that type of uh, telemetry and analysis? Um, a mix, uh, the basic telemetry of response rates, SLAs, a lot of the stuff that you, that is pretty widespread across APIs in general. We were relying on other tools for. So we were using uh, basic SDKs, we were working with Datadog for some of our own hosted systems. Um, and there are a lot of tools that are really, really good at that space. I certainly wouldn't recommend someone reinvent the wheel there. Mm -hmm. But the area for us that was not as ripe with available resources at the time, although that's changed pretty drastically in the last two years, was a lot of the metrics around our AI modeling and its efficacy and the response rates of individual models looking at individual security features. That was something that we did a lot homegrown and tried to triage. And we sent some of the data to reporting and analytics solutions, but really it wasn't as graceful a funnel to get that information back to our AI team that was building the models to iterate on. And we needed to come up with custom solutions at the time to help with experimentation and get them live feedback on whether or not the models are performing well in production. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, Oftentimes we think that getting the model out into production is the hard part. And I think I agree with you that, that yeah. keeping it in production is the hard part. Um, yeah, they were both hard, but you know, it's, it just comes down to which problems you're facing at a certain time. We knew the first one was going to be keeping it in production and actually didn't realize until we had four or five AI engineers that we needed a lot of sophisticated offline processing, uh, clustering systems to help them scale up the resources to do computer vision training at scale. Mm -hmm. um, and that, even though we were at the cusp of AWS and other cloud providers starting to have some good tools to help us with this problem, they were just coming out and we really had to rely a lot more on our own uh, structures and processes and homegrown solutions for that. You also mentioned kind of the monitoring or degradation of system performance. And uh, my personal experience has been that there is a deluge of information and metrics in this space. Um, no matter what platform you use, no matter what analysis tool, and that every dashboard seems to just kind of glom on another, one more graph, one more monitoring metric. So um, once you hit a problem, you know, there's plenty of information you can kind of start splunking down and get into the, the weeds to find, find yeah. the issue. But what have you seen be effective in that, in that monitoring space to that right balance? How, how did you find the, the right amount of information, but not so much overload that you got you got lost in the weeds and, and nobody looked at it because it wasn't 
it wasn't informative. Yeah. yeah, so I I've certainly faced the graph overload pain of seeing too many metrics on the same dashboard. And I'd say at scale, and especially when you're in production servicing real customers, it's important that someone has eyeballs on that stuff to catch the stuff that no one predicted. The, the spikes that someone didn't have an alert for, the uh, things that we didn't know were problems until they actually happened. Um, and that's where really a good SRE, production engineering, maybe even DevOps person is good to have on staff once you're really doing proper support for a wide audience of customers. Um, but the daily developer routine for us was really trying to preempt and assign alerts for key and critical failures. Um, I'd say the first one I can recall from Confirm was that we were doing a lot of async processing for modeling since our jobs actually took quite a bit of time doing some of the image processing on these security features meant our round trip time was, you know, five to 10 seconds for, and that's, that's a long time in API request world, right? Um, but we actually had to set up custom alerts and triggers to monitor some of the queues that we had set up to see if they were exploding or beyond a certain threshold of reasonability, and then also send that back to do some of our auto scaling and triggers. And those are the kinds of things we could predict and the developers working on them knew were problems. So much better than just setting up a blanket graph of a bunch of things is actually set it, spending time setting up alerting for imbalanced thresholds. The things you can predict set up lines and reasonable expectations for if it goes above here, someone should get notified. And like many companies, we use pager duty to issue those, deal with on-call rotations, and capture a lot of the really bad ones so that someone could have eyes on it. But alerts are far superior to the graph overload in regards to responsiveness and actionability of things. Mm -hmm. so it sounds like that most of those metrics you were able to have the engineers think through as they were building out some new feature or adding adding some functionality that they would think through what are the what are the failure modes what are the the kind of the the red lines that I want to put in place and then be alerted based on that and then I guess there is some tuning based on if that was maybe the the wrong assumption um, and then you you also had a, a another piece there which was interesting of like that um, or maybe you didn't mention of like failure resolution or self healing on the auto scaling of like how much time would you spend on the first piece of alerting, getting humans involved to help remediate versus engineering solutions to, to self-remediate or self-heal um, any scaling issues or, or performance degradations? Yeah, I, I've mentioned auto-scaling as a potential reuse of this same alerting process, but the big first and foremost reason to invest in it was to send notifications to on-call groups and make it so that we could get human engineer eyeballs on problems like this. It was much easier if we were running out of, capa out of capacity on a server to manually scale it up. And as a startup at the stages I've been at, the cost of the infrastructure supporting this wasn't at a significant enough scale for us not to just be conservative with our hardware usage in production. Um, once you start getting an enormous mass of customers, that game becomes a little bit more balanced and calibrated, but you tend to overcompensate on a hardware case in favor of user experience when it comes to scalability at early stages. You really don't want the reason you lost a customer to be because you were $10 too cheap on hardware. Um, but alerting was the big one. And it just so happened that many of the ways we funneled alerts out of our system, we could capture through auto scaling groups. And when we did bring on a dedicated DevOps team, they were able to piggyback on alerts already shipped out of the applications to do some of these triggers, which was additionally helpful. And, another reason to have good standards and structures for how alerts are shipped out of a system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that you viewed developer estimates or the variance around developer estimates as your signal about uh, technical debt in a particular system and when it was time to begin to think about resolving um, or, or investing in remediating technical debt, paying down technical debt in the system. Can you talk more about that? Where, how did you come to this or, or how did you start to, to see this? I haven't heard this too many other places, so I'm intrigued to, to hear your thinking on this. Yeah, and the difficult part is that if you have a growing team and your team size is changing a lot, the reason for discrepancies can be wildly different. Um, sometimes it's due to technical debt, sometimes it's just because every time you look at the code base, it's foreign because a thousand people were contributing to the same code base. Um, that's why having story points using, you know, a, a tail window of historical data to really figure out what's to be expected is so important. 
Um, you, but if you're wildly off, if you're finding yourself with some of your bigger items that were estimated for a sprint or two are taking a month or two, and that happens more than once, it's really more negative um, metrics than it is things that you can judge from subtle discrepancies. It really has to be large, repeated macro discrepancies to really be a signal. Um, and that really shows either it's a new engineer that didn't know how to estimate themselves, but especially with your more senior folks, something's wrong if they are unable to predict how to invest their own time. Um, they can't navigate the application, they can't contribute to it, things are breaking. Any number of things usually are not the results of an existing, otherwise good engineer doing a good job, suddenly doing poorly at the job. There's usually some other weakness in the system and then you need to spend more time figuring it out. You don't run into that one recurringly, I'd say. It's not something where every sprint you'll find, hey, I'm, I'm behind now, so it's time to focus on technical debt. It's more every quarter or so, you look at that tail window and you say, hey, we were behind all three of these in a row at a, by a pretty sizable margin, and maybe it's time to look at why. Yeah, so you mentioned about developer productivity and sort of team success and looking back on, on a quarter basis. How have you thought through measurement of is a team succeeding? Is it working well? Um, other than this estimation and are they able to estimate their work and, and hit sort of roughly hit the target that they set for themselves? Um, have you seen other good measures of is this team being productive in its, in its output and its velocity? Is it meeting its uh, capabilities? Um, it's a really tough one. I'd say that's a constant struggle to try to put on rails, so to speak, and figure out a metric that will just automate itself to tell you whether or not someone's good at their job, right? Or if the team's good at their job. I'd say it's really, really important to know who the team's uh, target audience is. Who is it that they're solving a problem for? And make sure the feedback from that group is really weighted high in evaluating the success of the team. Um, that feedback might not materialize and tell you whether or not the team is moving as fast as they could do. That really takes a coordinated and seasoned engineering lead or team lead to be able to say, hey, I think my team can move better and here's what I'd like to do about it. You have to rely on your uh, leaders and engineer capable people to really tell you things like that. But as far as the production and what's coming out, the, the quality, you can really gauge that from who the audience is. So DevOps, they're working on CI, CD and pipelines. If the developers can engage and get their code from their machine to production effectively and is happy or not unhappy about the proposal, then they're doing a good job, which is really an unfortunate thing for operations teams is that the metric is not unhappy, it's not happy, but um, that's a whole different conversation. Then if you're working on customer facing products, then you're really engaging either directly with the customers or relying on the sales or product teams to really proxy that for you because they've got their own metrics where they evaluate themselves. And really if you assume that, then you assume product teams are the teams that engineering teams are largely at the behest of. And, their feedback as to the quality of the relationship and quality of the production is really paramount. But putting numbers to that, obviously really difficult. It's more like survey-based weighting and NPS scores and happiness in general that you're trying to figure out how to quantify as best you can. And again, the game of, is it worth investing in hyper-quantification versus trusting our leaders at this stage and being a little bit more subjective about it? As you've seen uh, a team grow from like four to six to through up to 20 and then get absorbed by a larger company and kind of then to fully integrate in, into that team. Um, how have you seen, like, what are the, your rules of thumb or what are your guidelines around how to structure your org? What are the, what's the right time to start splitting teams off? And how do you think about uh, managing those, the sizing of teams and also the kind of the, when the time is to, to spin them, spin them off? Yeah, I, I really generally try not to split up teams until they are stomping on each other's toes. Because if you're splitting up teams to parallelize something, it should be because parallelization isn't, isn't organic from having them together. Like they are unable functionally to work in this same domain space or share these problem spaces together without risking collision. Um, so for example, at Confirm, we had at one point 16 or so engineers and we had them split pretty evenly between AI and the operations involved with that and our platform API orchestration, like production engineering group that was responsible for actually serving up the APIs, the logistics, the networking, all that jazz. And those did have reasons where their 
day-to-day -day work was entirely different. Their pipelining processes were different. Their way to produce code was different. And if we tried to integrate with the, them with each other, they may have collided with some different, different perspectives and different solutions. I'd say I don't like breaking up teams too early, but there are good reasons to do it. The main one is collisions. The second one is new ability to parallelize in ways you couldn't. Um, but aside from those two reasons, I like to have everything as macro and everyone working together as long as possible, mm -hmm. especially at the startup phase. Um, you obviously see much different scaling issues at you know, the big enterprise scale. And where I landed after the acquisition was obviously a much different experience where we weren't working with any, anywhere near the whole org. We had you know, our 15-person team in an otherwise 100-person org, which is in an otherwise 1,000-person org, and so on and so forth. And dealing with the logistics of evaluating performance there, splitting up and parallelizing there, they really had a model of individual attestation of my goals and on a half basis evaluation of whether or not you met your self-asserted goals. So they tried to rely a lot on intrinsic motivation of individual contributors to keep themselves in check over long periods of time and make sure that they were promoting themselves in that regard. And I'd say it was good in the sense that you didn't really need strong top-down oversight to do it. It was tough in the sense that everyone had to advocate for themselves and some people are just better at that than others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And naturally selected for those who could who could do that or or liked it or were just needed a little exactly. bit of a push versus maybe needing more of a push. So um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, when you look back on your experience um, of, of growing a, a startup through, I guess, a cons services company through into a startup into uh, another acquisition, what do you what do you feel like your your biggest mistakes were that you having having gone through that you would either counsel somebody else to watch out for or that you'd wish you could kind of go back and, and counsel yourself and to, to maybe avoid? Well, I'd say there was one glaring one that always eats at me that I, I wish I even had an answer now. I'm not sure I do, but I definitely didn't go into the experience with the forensic analysis driver's license prepared for educating customers and stakeholders and even myself around what do you do when you're not going to be 99.99% right you're going to be 85% right. And what do you do with the other 15% of cases? What do you do when that represents 150,000 people? And what do you tell customers they need to do if you're not going to do it for them? And games like that for, you know, really difficult modeling. And I think this is pretty prominent in the security world too. You can do stuff with networking and CVEs and machine to machine processes. It's pretty reliable when it comes to human introduction into the experience you're not 99.99% right. You're a much lower number. And if you're selling a SaaS product that shares numbers like that, really educating yourself and educating the customer on what to do about that is really, really, really difficult. Um, again, I don't know if I have the answer, but I definitely would have gone into it with much more open eyes and probably designed that into the product experience a little bit more than just shipping out a confidence score and saying, it's your problem now. I think this is a really interesting observation or insight or, or, or area of difficulty because um, I think often in software we have uh, we have coverage of maybe 85 percent or 95 percent of the use cases and so there are five percent of the use cases that just are 15 percent that just will never work that just won't work with the system or they you know the system can't figure them out and and how do you message to the to the customers and set the expectation appropriately yeah. Um, and then on the flip side, if, are you messaging so much to the customer that you're messaging to someone who's trying to abuse it and you just gave them the key? And that was the game with security too, is we couldn't say you missed the security feature in the top right corner of your driver's license because we don't want someone to know what they did wrong and risk someone being able to attack the system as a result. So it's, there's a lot of games. I'd say security was a new experience for me on the customer experience side, trying to figure that out. But yeah, there's a lot of other areas in software too where we don't know what we don't know. And when failures happen, we don't really know how to communicate them effectively. Mm -hmm. Predictable or otherwise, if it's predictable and we can do nothing about it, we don't really know how to educate a user on what to do about it themselves. What tooling have you been uh, really excited about recently or feel like you, you use and you're, you're surprised other people haven't adopted? Is there something that, um, some technique or some, some framework that you think is, should should have wider adoption, wider understanding? Wider adoption, I'm not sure. My favorite one of late has been 
something that actually is pretty well adopted by newer businesses. Um, HashiCorp's Terraform. We actually use that as part of our product. Infrastructure as code in general has been a big leap for being able to describe, audit, understand, and reproduce deployments and applications and infrastructure. And that is in large part, the kind of category of work that powers a product like mine. We are, we're focusing on the usability to try to make it so lots of people can contribute to an otherwise giant templating system. Um, but tools like that, infrastructure as code in general has been uh, a lifesaver. And that's actually what let us do a lot of our distributed systems that confirm in such an organic way, even though we had on-site deployments to customers too, is having a reproducible template that could reproduce not just our own production, but customer A's production and customer B's production and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of people use it. Um, I'm struggling off the top of my head to think of specifically something that people don't use, but I'd say there are a lot of businesses that predate tools like that that should really consider updating to them. But mm -hmm. if you want, you can always update to Architect too. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, skip the whole landline phase, go straight to cellular. Great. Is there anything else you feel like we didn't touch on that uh, relevant to the discussion here of quantified software, how to measure the software development process and, and improve the, the state of the art? No, but specifically in the AI category, I wouldn't undervalue both structured experimentation tools for teams to make them performant, but also visibility for some of your product teams, your sales teams into some of that iteration. AI modeling for many people, even engineers, is a black box. Um, if you really want to focus on making it so that you can get buy-in from your stakeholders, both your customers and other internal teams that may not understand your work, open the kimono a little bit, show some of your progress, show how the experimentation platform works and some of the graphing that it produces, and try to, try to educate people. Because at the end of the day, if we're not going to be 100% accurate on every single request lifecycle, someone needs to understand why and understand that people are working hard doing it. And don't take that for granted. Make sure you're showing that so that people trust you and give you the bandwidth to experiment and come up with culprit solutions. I'm not sure I'm prepared to advocate for one in particular right now. Um, all I'd say is that DIY or otherwise, the tool set is still new. Just don't undervalue exposing it to at least internal stakeholders for understanding and education. So have a tool, build it, buy it, something, but don't, don't think you can go without it. Okay. That's right. Otherwise, three to six months go by and people don't think you're doing anything and it becomes a big point of friction. Well, thank you, David. This has been been really great. And of course, uh, everybody should go check out Architect.io and, and yes. manage uh, dependency management on top of CI CD. Yep. Lots of security, lots of networking benefits, but most importantly, developers have a path forward for contributing to cloud native applications. So give it a shot. It's all open source and freely available. So it's open to everyone. Awesome. Thank you.